In early 2025, Adobe raised the price of their photography plan from $10 a month to $20 a month. And for that price, frankly, I think you're getting ripped off. So in today's video, I want to take a look at another photo editing program and see if it can do the same job. This will be Affinity Photo with the new 2.0 version. The benefit of using Affinity Photo is that you only have to pay one time and there's no subscription. And it costs about $70. However, they will charge you if they make a new version. In other words, I paid $70 for version one. Now that there's version two, they want me to pay $70 again. And I'm sure when they make a version three, they want you to pay for that. So while Affinity Photo might not have a subscription, that's something to consider. All right, so we're here in Affinity Photo. I'm using the free trial edition. You might wanna do the same. And what I wanna do is test out all the different components of Affinity Photo and see how it compares to Photoshop. First up, we have the user interface. It's very similar. I've got my adjustment tab, my layers tab, history, and pretty much everything else you'd need. And just like in Photoshop, you can actually drag these around and place them wherever you want. I like to have my channels and layers and everything down here though. If you're looking for a tab and you can't find it, go up to window and you might be able to find it from this list here. Anyway, once you've got things organized, the next step is to look at your adjustments. We've got levels, white balance, curves, channel mixer, again, pretty much all the same tools we would expect to find in Photoshop. Let's start off with maybe a curves adjustment layer and see how this works. We've got this default button, and when I click on that, that brings up a curve tool. From here, I can either add some points on the graph and manipulate them, or I can click on the picker button. And with the picker button, just like in Photoshop with the hand tool, I can find somewhere to make darker, click and drag that down on the photo, then find somewhere to make brighter, and click and drag up. It's a very powerful way to do your curves. There is also an opacity slider which you can turn down if the effect is a bit too strong, as well as blending modes which will change the effect of your curve. Next, I can try adding a selective color layer, and we do have a lot of green and yellow, so let me try that. I can move my sliders left and right to get the colors that I want out of the image. This is a very powerful way to edit the image when you're doing the SHO color palette. When I've finished with the selective color adjustment, I can toggle the visibility to confirm it looks good. Then I can lower the opacity if it's a bit too strong. All right, so this shows us that we can do more or less the same adjustments as Photoshop, but let's try something else. I'm gonna hit Control Shift Alt E, and that creates a composite layer, everything we've done combined into one. With this new composite layer, we'll go to the top left corner and look for the develop button. It looks kind of like a light bulb. This brings us into an interface that's similar to Camera Raw. We can adjust the exposure, the black point, the brightness, along with the contrast and clarity, the saturation vibrance, the white balance, and more. And then once you've made your adjustments, you go back up to the top left and click on the blue develop button. And one thing you need to understand is that when you're working with this develop module, you need to be on a new composite layer, otherwise it's not gonna work as intended. Things are going pretty well so far in Affinity Photo, and let's see how far we can really push this software. With this pixel layer, I'm gonna rename it. I'll call this contrast adjustment or something like that. Then I'm gonna duplicate it by right-clicking and duplicating the layer. This one though I'll call color. And just like before, we'll go to the top left corner, click on the develop button, and now I'm only focused on the colors in the image. For this, I'll go to the white balance and adjust the temperature and tint. I might also add a bit of saturation or vibrance as well. But when I'm doing this, I have a very specific goal in mind, which I'll show you in a minute. Assuming that looks good, we'll click on develop in the upper left. And now we're gonna use the power of luminosity or color mask to just target different parts of the photo. For this, we'll go up to layer, new live mask layer, and we have the option for luminosity range, which will be brightness, or hue range, which will be color. Let's try luminosity range. This brings up a new tool, which I recommend you start by clicking on the preview button. And if there's a white layer mask, that means the effect is targeting the entire photo. If I move these two points though to the very bottom, 
that makes it black. That turns off the mask and we can no longer see the photo. So what you're trying to do with these luminosity masks is make it so that whatever you want to be targeted is white, but everything else is black. And the brighter this gray color is, the more it will affect the photo. This might make more sense for some of you if I turn off the preview. Because now when I make these adjustments, you'll see it happen in real time. So whatever makes more sense to you, feel free to do that. I normally like to have preview on those so I can actually see whatever's dark I know I'm not targeting. There's even a blur radius available, so if you don't want really defined harsh edges, you can turn this up quite a bit and smooth that out. Then if we turn off the preview button, and if we close out of this live luminosity range mask, what you'll notice is that the luminosity mask is applied to that color layer, which we created just a minute ago. And if I toggle the visibility of this, you can see we're only adding blue to the brightest parts of the nebula, thanks to that luminosity mask. If you want to continue editing the luminosity mask, just click on this button. That brings the tool right back to where it was, and you can continue to play with it. Or, in this case, let's say I only want this blue to affect the jellyfish, not over here. Well, if that's the case, I'll right click on the button, and then choose Edit Mask. This allows me to use the black paintbrush, or white paintbrush, to paint out areas that I don't want to be affected. This is all very similar to Raya Pro, which is a great plugin for Photoshop, but like I said, if you don't want to pay $20 a month for Photoshop, then this is the next best thing. And if you don't want this harsh edge here, you can either use a bigger brush with a lower hardness, or go up to Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. That'll blur out that edge there, and you can apply that to the photo. To get back to our actual image, we'll just click on the name of the layer, and there we go. Here's now our before and after, and hopefully you can see that we're only targeting this portion of the image now, thanks to our mask. Another problem we need to deal with is this ugly flare left over by my ZWO filter. For this, I'm gonna hit Control-Shift-Alt-E again, and that's probably Command-Shift-Option-E if you're on a Mac. And over on the left-hand toolbar, we do have a spot healing brush, just like you would expect in Photoshop. The way this one works, though, is you need to choose a reference area first by holding down the Alter Option key and clicking. This is now my region of interest, and I can just paint over the little flare, and now nobody would ever know that was even there. So that works quite nicely as well. All right, we're almost done for this video, but let's do maybe one or two more things. With a color balance layer, this should look familiar. It's the same thing in Photoshop. We can adjust the shadows, midtones, or highlights. But I'm gonna be doing this with the idea of color masking in mind. So what I wanna do first is just move these sliders left and right and see what it does. All right, maybe I wanna have a bit more red over here. And even maybe a bit more purple. Then I'll go to the highlights next and move those around. When I've made my adjustments that I like over in this part of the image, I'll go up to Layer, New Live Mask Layer, but rather than doing brightness, I'll do this based on color with Hue Range. And there's a couple different ways you can use this tool. One of the easiest is probably with the Picker button. You can just click somewhere in the photo that has the colors you're just trying to target, in this case, reds or yellows. Or you can use the points on the color wheel and manually alter the color range. I would recommend turning on the preview though, just so you get an idea of what you're actually targeting. That'll make this easier. And it might not be a bad idea to blur this out as well. Once you've finished your adjustments, we can close out of the tool and do a before and after. I like that over here, but I don't want it to apply on the jellyfish itself. So just like before, I can right click on the Hue Range Mask button, choose Edit Mask, and then grab a black paintbrush and paint out everything that I don't like. And we'll blur this out with the Gaussian Blur. It is still a bit intense because it doesn't really blend with the rest, so I'll lower the opacity is something a bit more reasonable, maybe right around 50 or 60%. Finally, if you're ready to save your photo, you've got a couple different choices. You would think it would be as simple as going to File, Save, or File, Save As, but this only gives you the Affinity Photo option. You might want to do that just so you have a master file with all of your layers intact, but when you're actually ready to save this as a TIFF or a JPEG, we'll go up to File and look for Export. 
This gives you a lot of different choices, including TIFF, JPEG, and more. If you're gonna go with the TIFF though, which I'd recommend, you can do either eight or 16 bits per channel, and you can save the layers, which is a good idea. I would also recommend embedding the sRGB color profile unless you know what you're doing. That should give you the most accurate colors. Of course, if you're just trying to save a JPEG, you can do that right through here, and the default settings should work fine in most cases. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. I know this is a fairly quick video, but my main goal is just to show you that with a little bit of practice, you can make Affinity Photo work just like Photoshop, including your adjustment layers, your layer masks, the interface itself, luminosity and color mask features, along with something similar to Camera Raw. Just wanna make sure, of course, when you're doing your Camera Raw filter, you're on an actual image layer, and that should work fine. And if you wanna learn even more about astrophotography and photo editing, then check out my Deep Space course, which now has over 90 videos that'll take you through the entire process. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in another video.